Good afternoon. I'm Jane Harmon, President and CEO of the Wilson Center, where our motto is, save the best for last. Many institutions around Washington have hosted events for this important book, but in my opinion, they were the warm-up acts. We're the real deal, as you'll soon discover. Among the over 540 people joining us on, on this a beautiful fall afternoon before a holiday weekend. Uh, our, our former chairman, uh, Joe Gildenhorn and his wife, Alma, uh, our former board member, Chuck Cobb, and our current board member, Peter Bashar. Today, we are celebrating and discussing, quote, the man who ran Washington, the life and times of James A. Baker III, uh, by husband and wife reporters, Susan Glasser and Peter Baker, no relationship to Jim Baker. Many of you have probably uh, heard of the authors. Peter is the New York Times chief White House correspondent and has covered four presidencies at the Times and the Washington Post, but being at the Wilson Center put him on the map. That's right. Uh, he has twice been a fellow at, at our center, first from 2010 to 11 and again, from 2000, again in 2016. In his first stint, he worked on a wonderful book, Days of Fire, uh, which is on the complex relationship between Dick Cheney and, and George Bush 43. Uh, Susan, on the other hand, was already on the map. She is ubiquitous. She's now a staff writer for The New Yorker, but also founded the award-winning Politico magazine, was editor-in-chief of Foreign Policy, and edited Politico and The Washington Post. Between Peter and Susan, almost every morning on my treadmill, uh, and noon and night, one of them is uh, on cable news. <laughs> they, they have been working on this book for seven years and have done nearly 200 interviews with their subjects, including three former presidents, uh, etc. I am particularly jealous, however, that they got to spend a lot of time with my favorite former Democrat, Jim Baker, uh, because he's a sensational guy and I almost never get to see him. This book was released uh, on September 29th. It's climbing in all the charts. And uh, in uh, addition to commending uh, Susan and Peter for writing a wonderful biography, I also wanna recognize my friend and their agent, Rafe Segala. So Susan and Peter, please explain uh, why you wrote this book and, and take us through some of the, uh, uh, the, the, the main parts of it. And by the way, there's another guy on the screen, in case you, I, I guess I did. I, I will introduce him in a minute after Peter and Susan speak and we'll all uh, join each other for questions and comments. So over to you, Susan and Peter. <laughs> well, thank you, Jane, so much. Really, it is a delight to be with you and you're right. I consider my home uh, away from home to be the Wilson Center. And I wish that we could be Good. doing this in person the way we have for previous books. It's a shame we have to do it on video, but if you have to do it on video, it's not a bad way to go. And we thank Secretary Baker for joining us today and especially for opening up his life to us these last seven years. He can tell you all the ways we got the book wrong. It's not, he's not responsible <laughs> for any of it, uh, but, he, but he was exceedingly generous with his time and his cooperation, opening his archives and opening his life to us. And we couldn't have found, I think, a more uh, more compelling subject because we, we wanted to write a book that was about a person who had been at the center of so many things from really the end of Watergate to the end of the Cold War. You couldn't really find anything that didn't have Jim Baker involved in some way or another. And we also thought his story told us a lot about Washington, about how Washington worked at the time and how it maybe doesn't work as well uh, today. And so I think that was one of the things that really got us going on. Well, that's right, Jane. I want to thank you and the Wilson Center and Secretary Baker. It's it's very daunting and intimidating for any author uh, to have the subject of their biography joining them. Uh, you know, we're we're not the experts, uh, but merely you know feel very fortunate. I think both of us do to have had the chance to tell this story. A lot of people said, "Well, why you know why is this coming out now, so close to the election?" And you know, but the truth is that we started this back uh, in the the mists of uh, the antediluvian uh, Obama era, right? And, you know, it already, I think, was clearly a moment in time that had passed that we were going to chronicle. So I think that was the appeal for Peter and I was the notion of uh, the man who ran Washington, but also when Washington ran the world, that, uh, you know, we're now in 
arguably sort of another hinge point in history when that uh, post-Cold War era that Secretary Baker did so much to construct is, is unraveling. And uh, the assumptions and habits uh, and needs of American foreign policy at that time are you know, so different in many ways than the moment we find ourselves in, both in terms of our domestic politics as well as international. So that was the impetus. But I will say this, since our subject is joining us today, <laughs> You know, I'm a reader of biographies my whole life, but I love the first part of biographies. I always do. Uh, and that's the part that was a true, uh, you know, open page for us, a, a true discovery for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that having the chance to look into, uh, you know, the Houston uh, from which Secretary Baker came and also uh, his own family's remarkable story and to put him in the context of uh, the three previous bearers of the name James Addison Baker, because even though he's James Baker the third, he's actually the fourth, uh, which I <laughs> still wish mystery, that yeah. he would explain that better to us. One but, mystery we never <laughs> un, we never solved. <laughs> Absolutely, but you know that that for me was a real just a, a treat as a as a uh, researcher and a, at least an amateur historian. Uh, I can't wait to do this. I'm I'm so excited because you're here, Jim. Um, you are a special treat. Jim Baker has many titles, Chief of Staff for Presidents Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, Reagan's Treasury Secretary, Bush's Secretary of State, manager of five presidential campaigns and an unmatched advisor uh, to four presidents across more than a quarter century so far. Mm. Uh, he was also a member of the Wilson Center uh, board from 1977 to 1998, including when he was such a big shot over, overseeing the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, as Secretary of State. This makes him our most important board member ever. Uh, <laughs> and there's no possible way I can claim that his being at the Wilson Center put him on the map. He <laughs> is the map. <laughs> so he's also my personal friend, as you can all tell, and a man of great compassion. Uh, when Sidney Harmon died in, uh, in 2011, one of the first letters I received uh, was from Jim, who reminded me of his first wife's death at age 38. It's in the book and you will cry when you read about it. He offered condolences and encouragement as I had just begun my time at the Wilson Center. Uh, Jim, of course, had a role in persuading me to take the job at the center and leave Congress during my ninth term. And it has meant a lot to me that we chat occasionally and to visit his amazing Baker Center and uh, meet with my, my other friend, uh, Ed Dridgen, who directs his center. Uh, Jim, this book is so thorough about your accomplishments, but perhaps a way to highlight a few is to talk about some of the pictures. And Peter and Susan, you're invited to comment since you did such meticulous work. And if Jim Baker forgets something, please add it. <laughs> but what we're going to do is show four of those pictures, which show uh, various parts of your, of your life, uh, your professional life, and, and talk about them. So let's put up the first picture. Uh, the first picture in the book that I, that I want to talk about is a black and white picture of you, of, of you and Bush 41. You were his campaign manager uh, when he ran for Senate. Uh, he ran for several offices, which he lost uh, before he was first elected. You had to change parties to become a Republican. And, and you're doing this was basically your first foray into politics. Tell us about that and, and your relationship with him and how it turned Jim Baker, the, 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 uh, the third or fourth, uh, who had a background doing exactly what his father asked him to do into Jim Baker, the Jim Baker that we know, uh, the Jim Baker that is the, the man who ran Washington. We're unmuted and what I was saying is it's a real uh, pleasure for me to be here, both with uh, Peter and Susan, but also with you, Jane. And as I said before we started, you're, uh, you're a discerning Democrat in my view, <laughs> and you're my favorite Democrat, so I'm really glad to be with you. This picture uh, is hard for me to recognize. I don't know who those two young guys are in that picture, but, but I will tell you the way I got there is that 
My first wife died tragically, of course, of cancer when she was 38 years of age. And the last non-family uh, people to see her were George and Barbara Bush. And after she died, George came to me and he said, you know, Bake, he said, you got to do something to take your mind off your grief. How about helping me run for the Senate? And I said, well, George, that's a great idea, except for two things. Number one, I don't know anything about politics. I was really sort of apolitical because my grandfather had told the young lawyers coming to work for Baker Botts, the family law firm, if you want to be a good lawyer, work hard, study, and stay out of politics. And I, that was the mantra of my, of my life up until then. But he said, you got to take your mind off your grief. Help me, help me run. I said, well, okay, uh, George, except for those two things. One, I don't know anything about politics. And number two, I'm a Democrat. And uh, he said, well, you know, we can take care of that latter problem. Uh, and we did. And I, as Jane has said, that's when I converted uh, to the Republican Party. And I helped him by running Houston, the Houston area, Harris County, which is the most populous uh, county in Texas. And it was the home county of Lloyd Benson, who was uh, George's opponent and George Bush. And we won, we won Harris County, I think, by 60-plus percent, but lost statewide. Uh, in those days, uh, Texas was a solidly Democratic state. It had only elected one Republican statewide since Reconstruction, and that was John Tower in a special election to fill Lyndon Johnson's Senate seat uh, when he ran against five Democrats and he and he won. So that's what that picture represents. That was a that was the day we kicked off uh, George Bush's campaign for the Senate in uh, Texas Senate in 1970. Well, to be fair to yourself, though, Bush had expected to vote, to run against Yarborough, True. who was a much more liberal. Uh, Democrat than Benson. Benson, I, I read the book, folks. Guess what? <laughs> really knew some of these people too. Um, but but uh, Benson was much more conservative, and his background was very similar to uh, George H. W. Bush. So that changed the right. entire race. Because I just want to make you look good. You would have won it, I think, right? If it had oh been no, we Florida. wouldn't. Have won it. But but I'll tell you, for any Republican to have a chance statewide in Texas in those days, you had to run against a real liberal left wing Democrat, and and uh, Lloyd Benson was not that. <laughs> also, to be fair to you, you had toyed with before your wife died running for Congress for for H. W. Bush's old seat. And you pulled out of that because she was so sick of cancer from cancer. Um, but so it, it wasn't just the grief, which obviously is palpable in the book. It's just, uh, uh, and who, who could blame you? Uh, but it was also that you were, you were kind of looking for a career change. Am I right? I mean, practicing law yeah, wasn't well, the most fulfilling. I, I had practiced law for 18 plus years, I think. And, uh, and it had lost uh, a lot of its appeal. <laughs> Uh, and George had asked me to run for his seat when he vacated the congressional seat to run for the Senate. But uh, Mary Stewart was too sick for me to do that. So I had to pass. Well, just for the record, I'm a lawyer too. And the late Sidney Harmon used to say about me, she practiced law a long time, but she never got it right. <laughs> so, all right, let's move on to the next picture, which is one that I think many people will remember. Who are these people in this picture? And who's the, who's the guy with the white hair? Ah, well, the white hair is Tip O'Neill, who was the head of the, in effect, the head of the Democratic Party when Reagan was elected president. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the most senior Democrat in office, and he was uh, an old line uh, Massachusetts politician. That's Tom Carlogas. Yeah. Standing in the center there, he was he was our con our congressional liaison uh, uh, person in the White House in the first Reagan term, and that's me. And then I don't know who's on the right here. I can't tell. I not can't. Yeah. Yeah. I, anyway, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we we uh, tried we tried successfully, I think, to work with Tip. 
Kemp was, Kemp was one of these people. In those days, as you pointed out, both Republicans and Democrats would go to Congress or to go to, go to the White House or go to the Senate to do the people's business, not just to sit there and gnaw at each other and fight. And so uh, Tip was interested in getting things done, and we were interested in getting things done. Uh, and, and Reagan had a Democratic House for the entire two terms that he served. George H.W. Bush had a Democratic House and Senate for the one term that he served. So I got pretty used to working uh, the other side of the aisle. But that way, in those days, that was the only way you got anything done. Well, I would observe that's still the only way you get anything done. And the reason Congress is not getting anything done is that doesn't happen. The dirtiest four-syllable word in politics is bipartisan. Yeah. And the business model now is blame the other side for not solving the problem. Because yeah. if you work with the other side and you are bipartisan, then you get primaried, which is that's a new right. word. Yeah, so, well, you know what I said? We had President Obama here. At the, I'm at the Baker Institute uh, at Rice University. Now, and President Obama came, and we did a we did an event and the, the, talking about the same phenomenon. And what I said was that the responsible center in American politics has disappeared. It's gone. Right. You don't. There aren't any moderates anymore on either side, and that's a real tragedy for the country and for our democracy. You know, well, I, I, oh, Susan, you want to say something? Well, I do. Actually, it's kind of a question for Secretary Baker and an observation. You know, as Peter and I have been talking about the book, one of the things, uh, you know, people talking about those deals that you made with Democrats and, you know, wondering whether anything like that is still possible today. I, the example I've cited is the failure to produce a, a COVID relief bill uh, since April. And I have to say, even though I don't think I think it'd be very hard for you to be the chief of staff in this White House, but I still hold out the idea that you would never let them get away with not passing yeah. a bill at a moment of such economic crisis. With it, if I could add two more things, Jim Baker is, you, you've had COVID yourself, so you've had personal experience with this. Uh, but the other, the other comment to make is that both parties uh, could use this bill. I mean, the endangered moderates in the Republican Party, rumor has it that the Republicans may lose their majority in the Senate, need this bill. It could be crafted in a way to give them a lot of credit. That's yeah. not happening. It's being not crafted so that the Democrats get blamed for not delivering anything. Well, it takes two to tango, doesn't it? And, you know, back there when I was chief, chief of staff at the White House, we had Ronald Reagan who, uh, while people thought he was a hardcore ideologue, really wasn't. He was quite pragmatic, and he knew that we judge our presidents on the basis of what they get accomplished for the American people. And we, and we had a leader of the other side who wanted to get things accomplished, Tip O'Neill. And, you know, without Tip, there we would never have been able to reform the tax code. Without Tip, we would never have been able to... Uh, to restore the solvency of Social Security. Right. I mean, so it, it takes two, though. Both sides have to be ready to, to do it or willing to do it. I have to imagine if Jane Harmon and Jim Baker sat down, <laughs> you guys would have a bill in about an hour. It wouldn't take that long. <laughs> you know, there are eight laws on the walls of my office at the Wilson Center with the presidential pens. Most of them are in the Bush 43 uh, administration. You have to work with people to make anything happen. And it was post 9-11 and America was under attack, not just one, one party uh, by, by uh, a terror threat outside our country. And now it's inside our country. So right. it's, it's a big problem. And if we don't work together, uh, we won't defeat it. So uh, there are stories about Tip O'Neill, by the way, and Reagan uh, fighting all day and then drinking together at night. There was a lot of liquor in those days. And, uh, <laughs> And, and that's they, a great they story. Both, they were both big Irish politicians, and they <laughs> both loved a good story, and they told a lot of good stories to each other. And, and the, the other footnote to that was Congress met, uh, you know, in week blocks, not on three-day blocks. So members of Congress lived right. in Washington. Their kids went to the same school, were on the same Little League team, and they knew each other. That's Makes correct. a huge difference. And correct. that's gone, too. 
Uh, okay, next picture. We're getting good at this now. Okay, who's the guy on the right with a little scar on his forehead? Who's that? We used to call him Gorby. <laughs> he was, he was uh, that guy should go down in history as a real hero mm -hmm. because he's the one that made the deci fundamental decision not to use force to keep the Soviet empire together. And I think this picture was taken in one of my first meetings with him in the Kremlin. And we worked very closely with him. It was, it was a seesaw thing for a while because both of us, both Gorbachev and, and Bush, were being harassed uh, by their hardcore uh, wings to, to by their hard, hardcore supporters, uh, not to give away things, not to, not to compromise too much, be careful, you know. And so we both uh, had, that, had that hurdle to overcome, but that's a good picture of Gorbachev. And he, uh, I really think he should go down in history as, as a significant figure who, uh, for the first time, refused to use force to keep the empire together. But so did his foreign minister, Edward Shevardnadze, with whom I work so very closely. Well, and so did uh, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, who wanted to end the Cold War peacefully. Let's remember, it was a Cold War, not a hot war. Uh, but let me ask you, and Peter, I know you want to chime in on this. One of the hardcore opponents of this uh, at the time, I think he was Secretary of Defense at the time, but I'm not sure, was a guy named Dick Cheney. I think we've heard of him, uh, and uh, Peter wrote about him. Uh, and you famously said, if this is accurate, uh, dump on Dick with all possible alacrity. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe you didn't it. say it. Maybe it's fake news. But anyway, how did you manage Cheney? I mean, he, turned, he showed up again in the, in the Bush 43 administration, and he was uh, pretty formidable. Yeah. Well, are you asking me that question? I, I want to tell you something. I, I go way, way back with Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney was a 32-year-old White House chief of staff who selected me to become uh, President Ford uh, in the Ford administration. He selected me to become President Ford's mm -hmm. successor delegate hunter in the race against Ronald Reagan. So Dick and I go way, way back. And the quote that you've just mentioned, as Peter and Susan can elaborate on, uh, happened when Dick, when Dick went out on, uh, uh, in response to an Evans and Novak column and said, Gorbachev's going to fail. And I, I picked up the phone, I called the president, I said, I said, wait a minute, Heffy, I said, I called him Heffy when, when we were not <laughs> when we were in private when nobody else was around. I said, well, you can't have two or three different formulations for foreign policy. Either we want to work with Gorbachev and want to see him succeed, or uh -oh. and they did. Yeah, Peter, any amendments to this story? No, that's about right. Look, I think that, you know, we interviewed uh, uh, Vice President Cheney about that as well. And he says, look, you know, Baker was right about that. I was out of my lane and I shouldn't. Uh, he, he, con he confessed to that. And I actually think one of the interesting. Oh, we don't. And if we do, then you need. Yeah, I think we've got Jim partly frozen. I'm not sure what to do he, about that. He's back down. You're back. OK, Jim, you're back. Why don't you finish uh, your answer? I'm back. I yes. finished my answer. Okay. I think I finished my answer. All right, well, well, Peter is explaining what you meant. Peter, what? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I would never do that. But I was, I was saying, Secretary Baker, that we'd interviewed Vice President Cheney about this, uh, of course, as part of the book. And he copped to it. He agreed that you were right and that he was wrong and that he was out of his lane and he shouldn't have been part of his, uh, you know, on your territory. But you guys had actually a pretty interesting, I mean, there were differences of opinion that were legitimate. And, and held out in private about how far to push the Soviets, particularly when they were falling apart, right? I mean, you yeah. you, you, and, and President Bush, I think were more concerned about, you know, uh, holding the center from, from, from collapsing too volatilely. And, and, and then Secretary Cheney thought better to just to fragment the whole place as much as possible while you still could, because you'd have a lot smaller pieces to deal with. Yeah, but he but he he really supported the the policy. I mean, he, he he was off the reservation that one time, but he didn't go off again. 
<laughs> well, I'm not going to lose to you twice. Uh, but but I'm just saying. I mean, I uh, most people now had some of my some of my own issues with Dick Cheney over the years. I've also agreed with him a lot. And after 9/11, which is when most of this happened on when I was around, uh, we all wanted to protect the country. And the disagreements weren't about. Uh, blaming each other, the disagreements were about the best way to protect the country. And that's not a bad disagreement to have. And I still know Dick Cheney, and I'm glad he's healthy again. Speaking of which, I did ask you about your COVID. Are you healthy again? Yes, as healthy as, as, healthy as you can be at 90 and a half. I'm not doing bad. I went elk hunting last week in, uh, in Wyoming, so I'm doing all right. And you still playing tennis? I know you were. No, 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 no. I quit that. Quit that a long time ago. I start, pick, took up golf. George Schultz got me interested in golf when I was 86 years old. And uh, no, I'm sorry, in 1986. And I haven't played tennis since 1986. Well, George, uh, um, he's about to be 100. Is he still yeah. playing golf? Yeah. I bet he's no. still playing golf. No, no. no. Okay. Amazing. Uh, may you all be healthy for forever. We're just great leaders <laughs> uh, in, yeah. our, in our recent history. Okay, fourth picture. Yes. What is that? Well, that's a, a trip I took. That's me and uh, looking through a crack in the Berlin Wall uh, on a trip that I took to Berlin, I think perhaps right after the wall fell. I don't have a clear memory of exactly when that was, but I know that's a piece of the Berlin Wall, and that's me when I was Secretary of State looking through a crack in it. Well, you became the first uh, Secretary of State to, uh, to, to be in East Germany, uh, I think, after the wall. Was it after the wall fell or before the wall fell? That was, that was, uh, that was after, and I was the only sec Secretary of State to ever go to East Germany. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it happened after the wall fell, and I remember crossing the Glanicky Bridge in Potsdam, where we used to exchange prisoners during right. the Cold War. The Soviets would give us a prisoner, we'd give them one. And it was, uh, it was like being in two different worlds. Uh, it, 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 the, the infrastructure was so dilapidated and worn out and torn down, and the, there was no bright lights, everything was dim. It was uh, like a difference between night and day. And of course, that's what was involved in trying to put the two Germanys together, East and West Germany. Well, it, it, uh, having been a student, I think, and going into through Checkpoint Charlie into East Berlin, it was right, two, two completely different places. Now that the wall's down, uh, I'm one who's been uh, back to Berlin many times. I've also been on that Potsdam Bridge. And it's an amazing uh, recovery story. And a lot of credit, in addition to going to you, goes to Angela Merkel, uh, who was brave and it, uh, herself a child of East Germany uh, with a big dream. And it was a huge, uh, yeah. Yeah, a <laughs> yeah, huge but, thing yeah, for Germany Hel to pay for. She was, a, she was a minister at that time for Helmut Kohl. Mm -hmm. And Helmut Kohl was the guy who really drove German unification. He and his foreign minister, Hans Dietrich Genscher. Yeah. One so, great story uh, about that, Susan. one great story about that, about the, the West Germans that Secretary Baker worked with, is uh, that he also had to perform high stakes diplomacy between the two of them because they were both instrumental in it, but they didn't talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that was the, that's the way it works in Germany. The, the uh, chancellor is one party, and oftentimes the foreign minister is from a different party, and that was the case with Genscher and Kohl. Yeah, well, uh, the more I think about an earlier question that one of you asked, Peter or Susan, I think we should outsource the United States Congress to Baker and see if we can get anywhere. Uh, it's really a loss. And a point I didn't make is I think, uh, yes, the center has shrunk, but there still are a few people who want to do deals. And uh, they're beating their heads against a wall. I mean, because the, the place doesn't permit it. And just there's one deal, actually, I would say, you may agree with me, that happened in this last year. And I give the Trump administration a lot of credit for it because they started it. And that is USMCA, the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement which is a big update rewrite of NAFTA. 
And mm -hmm. uh, both parties supported it. Just imagine. It's also a win for Mexico and Canada. And, right. you know, how, did, how did that happen without you, Jim? <laughs> uh, were you there? And we just don't know that. Then you're easy. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, let me ask you a couple more questions. And we have some from the audience. So get ready. Um, my first question is, you know, I, I probably think your biggest accomplishment, aside from, you know, winning all the tennis doubles with H.W. Bush, I gather from reading this, you're on the wall of the Houston Tennis Club and all that, um, was uh, your major role in ending the Cold War. Now, a lot of people, including me, think that a big mistake we made after the Cold War ended was not to have a strategy for the post-Cold War world. We thought we won, they lost, uh, and everybody wants to be like us. And guess what? Everybody doesn't want to be like us, including a country, a little country called China. Um, do you do you think? Do you think I'm right? And if you had been there, uh, what would you have been advising? I mean, starting in the, I guess the, well, where were we? Where are we? Uh, in in uh, um, the Clinton administration. I mean. Do you think we missed a bet here and that we should have been thinking more strategically? Well, I, I don't think it's fair to other people to say if you'd been there, I was there. And uh, we did try some things that didn't that didn't pan out. You know, we we talked about maybe uh, creating some economic assistance for the unified Germany. Uh, but at that time, it was against you know, uh, I'm sorry, uh, for for the Soviet Union. But at that time, it was against the law. We had laws on the books that prohibited it. Furthermore, we'd just gone through a recession, and we didn't have the money to give to uh, a country with whom we had fought a Cold War for 40 years. So we didn't we didn't do anything uh, with respect to that. And I think, in retrospect, we should. We should have. I think the big mistake we made was that we overpushed the expansion of NATO. We, we did it in a, it, it was, you know, that was our goal. That was our policy and everything. I don't argue with that, but we did it in the wrong way. It was too aggressive. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons we're now here in a, another Cold War with Russia, because we, we, all, we went too far. Well, I was in Congress then. I, re I remember how eloquent Madeleine Albright was as, as a, you know, a refugee from, from Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And I think she carried the day. It was interesting that George Kennan, you know, he, the, the, the vaunted diplomat before you, uh, wrote a long piece of uh, advising against NATO expansion. And uh, he did not carry the day either. Mm -hmm. um, so a few questions from our uh, vaunted audience. Uh, first one, um, the, the, the title of this book is, is The Man Who Ran Washington When Washington Ran the World. And the uh, question is, uh, why doesn't Washington run the world anymore? Well, that's a time. Maybe that's a title. Uh, maybe that's a question for Peter and Susan. Okay. Who, who, who picked the title? <laughs> All right. <laughs> but I think I, I think we don't run the world anymore because because of the political dysfunction we're experiencing in this country. Uh, American leadership has diminished and is has, has almost disappeared, and I think that's very very regrettable. But I bet you Susan and Peter would be would have an an, an opinion on that. Well, look, uh, you know, you all know better better than we do that the end of the Cold War in a way was an artificial moment of uh, American mm -hmm. both economic and political dominance. And, you know, it, it turns out to have been an outlier in terms of world history rather than uh, a new normal. I do think that, you know, one of the shocks of the last decade is realizing uh, uh, that the inconceivable happened because we did not allow ourselves uh, to have a big enough sense of what the possibilities were. Uh, and, you know, I include myself in this. I mean, I'm a sort of a child of that 1989 generation, right? You know, this was the fall of the Berlin Wall 
when Secretary Baker was presiding was the year I graduated from college. And I, I think, you know, what we had as a framework for this period of time was that it was sort of a march of history toward, uh, you know, perhaps yeah. the end of history, but certainly towards uh, greater and greater uh, democracy and freedom. And, you know, we're now in a situation where, according to Freedom House, uh, you know, the level of democracy in the world has gone backwards for 12 straight years. Uh, and so I think it was a failure of imagination uh, to project that this moment in time, which turned out to be an outlier, actually was an enormous exception uh, to the rule of, of where the US uh, ranked in a, in a world of competing powers. I totally agree with that. I think everybody does. Uh, all right, let's go to another uh, easy question. This is for you, Jim. Uh, given that we have two candidates for president in their 70s, uh, the concerns about a president's mental decline has become a constant part of the political conversation. Uh, when did you realize, or did you realize, uh, uh, that uh, President Reagan was showing signs of memory difficulty in his second term? And what steps did the administration take to provide safeguards? Well, I don't think that I personally really ever uh, realized it, but then you got to remember, <clears throat> I had been at his right hand for over four years, and then I went to the Treasury Department. And so I was not there all the time. And I don't recall, I've had this question asked of me a number of times, and I don't really recall seeing his mental acuity uh, diminish when I was at Treasury. I'm sure it perhaps did, but I, I don't remember seeing it happen. Well, as an observation, I thought he was enormously brave once he understood his illness to disclose it yeah. uh, in a handwritten letter. Uh, and I do think that being truthful with the American people, this applies to anybody, this is not a partisan comment, no. about the state of one's mental decline is absolutely crucial. Um, so that, that especially in the, in the case of an election, they can make their best uh, uh, calculation. Peter, Susan, any other comments on that? No. I, I think that's right. And I think it's important to think about that this year and obviously, uh, we, we've, we've had this debate in some ways for four years now, uh, and, and uh, people live longer and, and do better later in life than they did even just 20 or 30 years ago, but it's still an important, I think, and relevant issue for journalists and politicians to, to consider. You know, we've had a number of questions, uh, Jane, in the course of, uh, you know, doing these interviews about the book for Secretary Baker, uh, questions about 1981 and uh, Reagan's mm -hmm. The assassination attempt, yeah. and I'm curious what you know. You must have also had people asking you this week about that, uh, especially the the decision not to invoke the 25th Amendment. Uh, do you have any thoughts about uh, you know whether that was a mistake or whether we need some new way? I mean, it it seems to me that that's not a very good tool for dealing with the incapacity of a president. Do we perhaps need to to rethink? Uh, you know, how we should go about making a decision like that. Well, there may, there may be a better way. Uh, <clears throat> at that time, I don't think there was a better way. And when we faced, you know, I, you've written and you're absolutely right. And that I think I told you that, uh, th that we didn't debate that one bit. And part of that reason was that I was chief of staff of the White House for a president who had a vice president who had run against him, the last man standing in the primaries. And I was so close to the vice president, or had been, and I was really, really determined to prove my loyalty to the president, which I think I did over time. But uh, I had no pushback from the hardcore Reaganites about whether we would invoke the 25th Amendment when the president was going under, uh, going into surgery. We made that decision, I think you point this out in the book, in a broom closet at the hospital. <laughs> and it was Ed Meese and Lynn Knopfler, Lynn Knopfler and myself. And uh, we, you know, I for one didn't want, didn't want, all the loyal Reaganites to think this was somehow a coup that I was initiating to, to pass power to the vice president. 
I'm not sure, Jane, that I agree that the that the 25th Amendment is, is unworkable. I think it is workable. And I think it may be perhaps the best way to go. I mean, I can't think of a better way. Maybe there is one, but I can't think of one. Well, it's a complicated amendment. I think most people think that parts of it work and parts of it don't work. Uh, and there is a serious issue about incapacity of presidents, especially older presidents. They That's don't right. seem so old to me anymore, but you know, for a lot of people like Peter and Susan, they're old. And so uh, we'll, we'll leave that. Let's go to another easy one, Bush v. Gore. Um, so the question is, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand it. The question is, do you really think Bush got more votes than Gore in Florida? But my question is, you got to answer that. You can think about that and dodge and duck if you'd like to. Um, <laughs> like you ducked about who you supported in the last election, but we won't go there, at least according to the book. Uh, but, but my question is, uh, this election may go to, a, to the Supreme Court. I mean, maybe. It's not clear in what form it would go to the Supreme Court if it does. And mm -hmm. predictions that I think are accurate that we won't know the winner on election night. We're going to have to wait because a lot of states which regulate the time and manner of elections uh, have chosen to start start counting uh, um, the the mail in in ballots on election night. So it'll take a while if there is the huge increase in mail in voting. Uh, yeah. But at any rate, it, any any observations on Bush v. Gore? Did you think Bush got more votes in Florida? But any uh, kind of thoughts forward about if this becomes litigation again? What you might advise? Uh, uh, those who are uh, responsible for that litigation representing either party? Well, I, I can answer both of those questions very succinctly. Bush did get more votes in Florida than Gore did. And it wasn't just by our count. And it wasn't just, uh, it was by, you know, the media organizations went in and did all the hanging chads and checked everything themselves. And, and on two occasions, two big deals, and they both came to the conclusion that Bush got more votes than Gore. Uh, and, and I'm convinced that that's true. Now, were there people in Florida and the southern counties who may have misvoted? Maybe so. But you don't count misvotes. You can't intuit a, a voter's intention after he's voted. You vote what the ballot says. So Bush did get more. Now, the second question was what? What advice would you give uh, if this, oh, oh, yeah, if that's this election goes to the Supreme Court? That's I know easy. this is very conjectural. That's, that's, that's very what? easy. That's very easy, Jane. Get, get some good lawyers. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, are you available? <laughs> I've been there and done that. But I remember a conversation with you, seriously, about... Uh, Warren Christopher, who was the lead counsel for the Democrats. And I had worked in the Senate for a guy named John Tunney uh, from California. And Tunney's chief of staff was Warren Christopher. So I knew him pretty well. And I don't think you actually gloat, Jim. However, you pointed out to me, I won't go into it in detail, the mistakes mm -hmm, made by the Democrats. And if they had done a few things differently, they might have they might have won. Uh, yeah. and they might have won in the Supreme Court. Uh, yeah, yeah right? they, really, they really might have. Well, they asked for recounts in four counties, all of them overwhelmingly Democratic counties. If they'd asked for a recount statewide, which they didn't do, who knows how that would have turned out. Well, why didn't they ask for that? I'm not a Democrat, and I wasn't in the in inner count oh. of the Democratic Party at that time. I can't answer that. All right, but so this time, I mean, that, that was a painful chapter. And, and to his credit, as I remember it, when the Supreme Court decided the case, Al Gore conceded quickly and, yeah. uh, and recognized uh, the presidency of, uh, of George Bush 43. He gave, right? a very, he gave a wonderful concession speech. That's the way power should transfer in this country of ours. It's one of the strengths of our democracy that we peacefully transfer power. And anybody who questions that is, is, I think, wrong, absolutely wrong. Well, I think a few folks are questioning that, or at least yeah. not saying whether they would. 
uh, uh, agree that there needs to be an orderly yeah. transfer of power. So what advice would you give those unnamed people? Respect, respect the tradition and the custom of transferring power peacefully following an ele a presidential election. It's one of the things that has made our country great, in my view, and it's one of the strengths of America. Don't question it. That doesn't mean you can't file uh, recount lawsuits in the states where you have where the law provides for that. That's not what it says, but, you, but it means something bigger than that, and it's more important than that. So if we get to a point, let's hope not, let's hope the election is conclusively decided within a few weeks, I don't think on election night. I'm, I'm now part of a group called Every Vote Counts, which is bipartisan, has uh, many of the former leaders of Congress like Bill Frist, Dick Gebhardt and others in it. And we're all saying be patient because we don't think the winner will be known on election night given the huge increase in mail-in voting. Yeah. Um, but we are saying, and certainly I'm saying uh, uh, that if we, when we do know the winner, we know the winner. And uh, it would be not just unseemly, but dangerous uh, to, to resist that, that decision. Um, I don't think you're disagreeing. Let me ask a few more questions and maybe Susan and Peter want to round this out. Think of really tough questions for our young 90 year old over here. Uh, so more about the election, mail-in voting. I mean, uh, some hey, are hey, saying- all right, I'll, I'll answer that question by directing you to the report of a commission chair, a bipartisan commission chaired by President Jimmy Carter and former Secretary of State James Baker, oh. written, written about seven or eight years ago. I can't remember, maybe maybe eight or nine. We talk about a lot about mail-in voting. I can't tell you everything now. We don't have time. Go look at that report. One of the things, of course, that we were focused on was voter ID. That's different than mail-in voters. But, but President Carter and I, we spent a lot of time on that, and we both concluded that if a voter appears at a voting station and has a government-issued voter ID card, uh, photo ID voter card, uh, given to him free by the state, that has to be done that, uh, that no voting registrar would turn him away. But you, you should look now and see what people say about photo IDs to vote. It's like, it's like a poll tax. Well, that wasn't what President Carter and I concluded, and, and nor the bipartisan commission which we put together. Well, just, I, I won't prolong this, but there is, uh, I can't find it, uh, no proof that there will be national irregularities in voting uh, and uh, huge uh, demand to vote early, which is great. I already sent in my absentee ballot to California, which I expect will be counted. I vote absentee and have for years. Uh, and lots of people are doing this. So it, wouldn't it be nice if we end up with uh, a clean election or a clean enough election? Uh, perfection yeah. is not an option. And yeah. I, think we, I think we should be able to get there as a country. Do you agree? I agree. Okay. Um, so Peter and Susan, come on. A couple <laughs> of hard ones for him. Let's go. Go. Oh, well. Oh, uh, all right. Yeah. You know, on, uh, look, on January 20th, January 20th, we're going to have either a new president or a president with a new lease on life four more years. Secretary Baker, what would you want to see done in this next two years? You, you, you gave famously President Trump a two page memo giving him some advice uh, into 2016. What would your two page memo of advice be to the next president or the president who's gonna uh, be uh, re-inaugurated on January 20th? Well, of course I'm a conservative Republican, <laughs> Peter. So some of the details of that advice might differ from what, uh, from what others might, might uh, perceive to be really important. I think one of the most important things, and I bet you Susan would agree with this, is to reestablish uh, American leadership internationally. When America leads internationally, it's been my experience we are a force for good and stability. We don't get out there and engage internationally because we want some, you want to get in somebody else's sandbox or we want some territory or anything else. But when we don't engage, we, there's a vacuum. 
And I think that vacuum is oftentimes, oftentimes filled by uh, actors who don't share our principles and values. So that would be one of the things. I also think we need to find a way to cure our political dysfunction. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest challenge facing America today. I think an equally big challenge, and many will not, will not agree with me on this, is that we are facing a ticking fiscal debt bomb. I'm a former treasury secretary. I worry about the level of debt that we have piled up. And once the interest rates rise, and don't make, make a mistake, they will. Once they rise, we're going to be inundated. We won't be able to, we, we, we won't be able to borrow enough money. I mean, it's going to be terrible. We have a debt to GDP today of about 100% and maybe over 100%. And that's an unsustainable. So let me ask something on Peter's question, if you don't mind. I mean, there's nobody in Congress anymore. I was one. I was a so-called blue dog Democrat that worried yeah. about fiscal responsibility. There's no. no one in Congress in either party, or maybe there's one, but there's no serious focus in either party on debt and deficit. And I, you're not I, alone I, worrying about this, but it's, I, it's, it's I, very I, serious. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And it used to be at the top of our political debate, right. but nobody ever talks about it anymore. But believe you me, it's a serious problem and it's going to bite us in the you know where once interest rates rise. Uh, can I ask one more question? Susan probably has a question. But, but um, uh, my question, I just want to ask you about this. It's something Joe Biden said that really appealed to me. Uh, and I wonder if you think the next president, whoever that is, should start here. He said that if elected, he would say, you know, thank you, America, for electing me your president. I'm not just the president for the people who supported me. I'm the president for the people who didn't support me. And I'm going to do my best to represent all of you. You think that might be a good starting point for the next damn president? Right. And, and damn right it would. And I, I did one of these with Peter and Susan a couple of three or four days ago. And I uh, reminisced about how I had, I had worked with Joe Biden. I really like Joe Biden, but I'm a conservative Republican and I'm scared to death about some of the people, some of the platform that he's adopt, had to adopt to get the nomination. But I've seen Joe work across the aisle. That's what I used to do all the time. That's the formula that I think we must get back to. So I support that. But I worry a lot about stacking the Supreme Court. I worry about the Green New Deal. I worry about all this radical stuff that's out there. Pardon me for saying that, but I'm a conservative Republican. Well, I, I would just say uh, a lot of that is not necessarily attached to Joe Biden. Uh, he says it's not attached to him. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot of radical stuff on the other side. And conservative, I, I would make a case, you know, I am a Democrat. I'm your favorite Democrat, so listen up. I would make a case that the philosophy of conservative Republicans has not been the philosophy, certainly in recent years, of the Trump administration. No, but many of the things that have been accomplished are, you know, I mean, if you look at the appointment of judges, if you look at the elimination of regulations, you can't, it, it doesn't, it, it looks a lot like our first term of the Reagan administration. That's what we spent a lot of time doing. Now, there are other areas that, that go the wrong way, and I'm the first to acknowledge it. Peter and Susan will tell you how, how difficult uh, it is for for a longtime Republican uh, with with uh, an unconventional Republican president. Can I? Sorry. Yeah, Susan, tell tell us because I. Your well, turn. You know, Secretary Baker is still a diplomat at heart. Unconventional is 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 a charitable word at best. <laughs> I I. I 
you know, we've asked him this question many times. It's interesting for us to see other people ask it, uh, you know, because I think they do find it hard uh, to understand uh, why Secretary Baker, who in some ways is the un-Trump, would, you know, even reluctantly vote for him. But, you know, you're also a lawyer and you take great pride in having, uh, you know, as you said, uh, you know, emerge with your, uh, you know, reputation unscathed and, and not having been indicted uh, in Washington. More seriously, you know, not in a policy sense, but some of the things that we're talking about today, right, are the question of the, the rule of law or the question of uh, support for American institutions like peaceful transfer of power. There's one thing that leapt out at me this week that I was curious to ask you about, which was the president actually literally calling upon the attorney general to indict his opponent in the weeks before an election. And I'm just wondering what, what you make of that and how you well, think- I think that, Well, what I make of that is that that's outrageous for, for a president to do that. I also, as you, as Peter pointed out, he found that little, uh, that little thing in my files where I, I was asked to, to intervene with Russia and, and uh, Great Britain about Bill Clinton's trip to Europe well, and, and I said, no, we couldn't do that. That's the way I feel about those things. And, uh, and so I'm, a, <laughs> I'm one of these very, very conflicted Republicans. But on balance, I want to see that this is not about a person. It's not about a party. It's about the direction that I think the country has ought to move it. It's about... Uh, uh, conservative judges. It's about elimination regulation. It's about pro-growth economic policy. It's about things like that. Those, in my view, overwhelm uh, the all of the negative stuff that we see uh, in terms of presidential behavior. So, so um, I'm I'm looking at my time. I guess we have two minutes, but. On behalf of the nonpartisan Wilson Center, where uh, both parties uh, have a chance to express views, and we try to present issues in a fair way, uh, you know, fair and balanced way, free from spin, and I think we do a pretty good job. We had Baker on our board for God's sake for forever, so that, that's a good start. Uh, I want to. I'd like to reframe it this way, um, and I and I would hope you agree. Uh, Bipartisanship is not a dirty word. Um, you said it yourself. You practiced it religiously. And mm -hmm. I practiced it religiously uh, when I held office. And uh, solving problems for the country is our goal, not for a party, uh, mm -hmm. for the country. And to do that probably requires both sides to give up a little and get Absolutely. a little credit. Absolutely. And these issues that we're talking about are hard. And uh, lots of them are. Debt and deficit's really hard in a time of COVID when there's so many people suffering and you could make a very good argument uh, for another relief package. Uh, and guess what? What will that do to the debt and deficit? So I, I'm, I'm not arguing for the policies. I'm just saying, how do we get there? What's the process that should work? The process that should work, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming I'm getting agreement from my, my favorite former Democrat is one where we talk civilly to each other. Uh, we we uh, try to operate on a common set of facts and then we make some of the hard decisions. And America always did that. And you did that in your various roles, uh, both getting you know some of your folks elected, but, but even more important than that, uh, ending the Cold War. I mean, let's just go there. It's huge. You didn't do it by yourself. You did it with a team. Uh, and you did it with people who talked to each other. So uh, going forward, uh, what's so nostalgic about this great book is that we, we knew how to do that. We've lost the muscle memory. We've got to grow people who, who can do this, who can channel their inner baker, both bakers. Plus, well, yeah, plus. Jane, I, I, of course, agree. I, of course, agree with that. Forget, forget the Baker part of it. But I agree with you. And the way we made it work in the Reagan and Bush administrations was to get the top of both parties together on board and get two party leaders 
who will agree that getting the people's business done is the reason you get elected and the reason you come to Washington. And if you got that, look at Social Security. Without Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, it never would have happened. Look at tax reform. Without Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, never would have happened. So I don't know whether there's a way out of this trap. I used to think if we elected one party to all three elements of power, House, Senate, and White House, that it would happen. But it didn't under 43, and it didn't under 44, because they both had the whole the whole enchilada, and we never got it done. So, uh, um, uh, Baker uh, Glasser, do you want to say anything uh, finally about this awesome book, about this awesome man? <laughs> you want to correct anything? <laughs> We're just very grateful to, to both of you for uh, spending some time with us today. And, uh, you know, it was, uh, I think, a great honor and an opportunity to write this book. Uh, we're sort of sad that the project is over because we keep hearing all these good stories we'd like to put in it. <laughs> so maybe yeah. we'll finish out at the next edition. Well, let me yeah. tell you something, Jane. Jane, let me say one thing. Yeah. When I, when I learned that Peter and Susan were going to write this book, I was really happy because uh, it meant that uh, there might be some, uh, might be a full-throated biography of me, of me out there before I croak. And uh, and it was written by some very, very uh, prominent and well-regarded and responsible journalists. And, uh, and, and I had more than one person come to me and said, aren't you worried a little bit what, about what's in the book? Uh, and I said, no, I'm not too worried because I don't think there's too much back out there that they can, that they can find that'll, that'll, that'll be really bad. But I want to tell you, the book is is complete it's got the good and it's got the bad it's got the good and it's got the warts and all so i just want to tell you how happy i was when i learned that peter and susan were going to write well i i think peter and susan are great i think you're great and i think we can all agree about something else that's great and that is the wilson center <laughs> uh, which has helped all of you over time and shown you off and uh, which I've enjoyed for a decade. So thank you so much uh, for uh, this conversation. I hope everyone agrees that we saved the best for last. Thank you so much. It was great to see you. Bye. Bye, Jim. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.